<laughs> All right. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, I do have to credit um, all of the wonderful students that have worked with me on this work over the last few years. Um, this, uh, the, the title of my talk is Crowd Computing, which is sort of an intentional play on words with cloud computing, um, because I really do think of this space, this basically the crowdsourcing space, as analogous now to what we get from the cloud. So where we think of the cloud as being uh, a source of elastic and highly available computational power and storage resources, uh, the crowd and some of the platforms that have come, up, uh, come out in the last few years uh, has become just that, highly available and elastic source of humans, of human resources. And what I want to talk about today is uh, some of the ways that we've been thinking about for building systems that are running on top of this crowd, this crowd platform, this crowd computing resource that, uh, um, that we now have to do problems that we don't know how to solve purely with software yet, Com computational resources aren't enough, um, and that one user, one end user, would struggle with solving. So here is a, a sort of a canonical example of that. It's a wickedly hard handwriting transcription problem, such as you might have with a doctor or with a teacher giving you comments on uh, um, something you've handed in. Um, turns out we can solve this with a small crowd of people obtained on demand and organized in the right way and do it actually fairly accurately and fairly cheaply. And I'll show you how in a little bit. Um, <laughs> but first, to just give a sense for what uh, the way I'm thinking about this, this whole space and the kinds of problems that I'm going to talk about, what crowd computing is is taking a large group of people on the web getting them to make small contributions. So no one person is doing the whole task, but they're uh, making small contributions that are coordinated by software to solve problems that we don't know how to do uh, with software by individual users. Uh, and <coughs> this group of people can be brought together and motivated in many different ways. Wikipedia does really well by motivating volunteers making small contributions. Um, there's been a big growth in games with a purpose. Uh, this is an example from University of Washington called Foldit that um, gets people to solve protein folding problems much better, much faster than uh, we know how to do with software. Um, sometimes I think of Facebook as being a global face recognition problem being solved by crowds, right, for social reasons. They're tagging their friends. Uh, <coughs> a lot of systems I'm going to talk about today use paid crowds, particularly we draw a lot, we build a lot of our prototypes on top of Amazon Mechanical Turk because it is a very convenient utility for um, experimenting with uh, crowdsourcing and, and crowd computing kinds of systems. Uh, it's highly available, there are constantly thousands of people on there on Mechanical Turk ready to do tasks. Um, the kinds of tasks that they do are very short, very cheap, uh, and most importantly, it's a programmable system. So we can write software systems that post jobs automatically on Mechanical Turk. Um, people do them. We pay those people. We collect their results. And all of that happens automatically and, and programmatically. So this really is a computing resource that consists of people that we can use as part of a, uh, a programming system. But I think of it actually as a prototyping platform. You know, from point of view of, uh, of sort of design and development, um, Mechanical Turk is uh, like the white, uh, the white lab mouse of, uh, of crowd computing. It's a, it's a great, easily accessible resource that we can throw lots of different things on top of, even though in the long run, maybe this isn't the right crowd to really deploy the system on uh, uh, in, uh, when we actually want to use it. Um, so that's a high level thing. What, uh, what I want to show you is sort of an outline of the rest of my talk is uh, first talk about um, the way that we think about building crowd computing systems at a low level, how we design algorithms that incorporate small contributions from many different people. And I'll, I'll show at least one example of one of those algorithms to solve that handwriting recognition problem that I showed you at the beginning. Um, then I'm going to present sort of a range of systems that we've built that try to illustrate some of the problems that we face and how we've addressed them in this uh, crowd-powered, crowd computing design space. And I'll finish up 
by taking a step back and talking about that design space in the context of these applications and thinking about um, what, uh, what we might look at going forward. So <coughs> I want to actually start by uh, giving a, a simple demonstration of one of the first problems that you run into when you're doing crowd computing, when you're developing crowd-powered systems. And one of the reasons I like Mechanical Turk is because it has this problem in spades. You immediately encounter it as soon as you try to post some tasks on Mechanical Turk. Um, <coughs> And it is a task that I like to uh, post every now and then because uh, it exhibits this problem and, and uh, um, it's a wonderful example of it. I'm just uh, offering people one cent to take a coin out of their pocket, flip it, and tell me whether it's head or tail all right? um, by typing in either H or a T. And very reliably, these are the kinds of results that I get back. So this is from a run of 100 different people. We've tried it on runs of 1,000 people. Proportions are exactly the same. So. Either there's lots of unfair coins out there in circulation, um, or there's not a lot of actual coin flipping going on. Um, and this, also, this doesn't add up to 100 because the 100th person had a completely different kind of coin, binary coin or something that uh, didn't give them a head of a tail. Uh, <coughs> so there, and there are interesting reasons why this might happen. In fact, we tried variations on this. Uh, in fact, if you say type T if it shows tails, if you switch the order of the instructions, the effect actually goes away and it becomes indistinguishable from 50-50. So you can, you, there's lots of psychological experiments you can perform on mechanical work. Um, from an engineering point of view, this is noise, right? And so that's the problem that you immediately face with crowd computing. It's that uh, um, the human beings that are part of the system are not going to behave in the same way as the software components that we're used to programming. So we have to build algorithms that are tolerant of this kind of noise from the computational units from the people that are contributing to them. So let me come back to this uh, handwriting transcription problem, give you an example of one algorithm, one sort of design pattern that uh, we've done some experiments with that deals with this kind of noise. So <coughs> the key idea of it is iterative improvement by many workers with constant quality control checking. And let me show you how this works. So one person in this workflow <coughs> gets a, an input, which might be a partial transcription. If this is the first person doing the transcription, this would actually be blank, and they would start by um, filling in a few words. And they're asked to do a small amount of work on this partial transcription, fill it in, fill in, a, fill in one missing word. And so they hopefully make an improvement um, to that transcription. And then to make sure you know that this person is not being noisy, is actually flipping their coin, is actually uh, um, making an effort here, we take the, their input partial transcription and the hopefully improved one that they produce, and we pass that to a small group of voters. And we ask that group of voters, which of these is a better transcription, better partial transcription of what you see up there? And um, they have two to choose from, and the highlighting here is just showing them where those two uh, transcriptions differ from each other. And we randomize the order of those two so that it's um, sort of not obvious, immediately obvious, which one uh, was the input and which one was the output. And we collect three votes from that, and the winner of that vote goes on to another stage of this process. So we sort of uh, uh, rinse, lather, and repeat um, until we get to a point <coughs> where we've got it all filled in. And somewhat amazingly, in this particular instance, after nine iterations of this process, so that's about 36 people working on it at Mechanical Turk rates, that's less than a dollar of, uh, of effort, um, we get a transcription that's very close to the ground truth that we originally um, started with. Some of the words are wrong here, so this word phony should be flowery, um, so all the red words here um, are incorrect, but uh, the sense of it is correct. And this is something that would have been a struggle for a single user to piece out by themselves. Here's another example. So this is printed text that has had a Gaussian blur applied to it. Um, I have a lot of trouble getting anything out of this. But uh, if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can sort of make out some words. And apparently, there are people in Mechanical Turk uh, who can figure this out. Um, because eight iterations of that process I just showed you um, transcribes it almost exactly right. Only this word is wrong. I think it should be wedged 
instead of embedded. Um, so the reason that this is working is because we've got a diversity of different you know, eyeballs and brains looking at this who, uh, who can see things that others can't. Um, and also because they're getting access to different amounts of context. You know, someone who is deeper into this uh, iterative process um, has some of the words filled in already so they can use their common sense in those words um, to, uh, to be able to figure out what's going on. So that's sort of an example of uh, a simple but effective crowd algorithm that sort of shows the power of using even very small contributions, just transcribing a few words or voting on which of these is better, um, <coughs> to do something very powerful. Um, it's very useful on a noisy crowd like Mechanical Turk, where we actually have a rule of thumb from our experience that when you post a task on Turk, 30% of the time, uh, the result you get back from that task is going to be poor in some way. So it's a very noisy crowd. Um, some of that poor work is actually being done by spammers, people that are um, just trying to get paid without actually doing anything. Um, <laughs> that's a fairly small number, but the rest of it is um, people who just don't understand or people who uh, um, are not trying perhaps as hard as they could. Other crowds may have less noise and you may not need as much um, uh, voting. In fact, um, there's some nice work that built on top of this algorithm done by uh, um, Dan Weldon and his students at University of Washington that showed that in fact you don't need this, you don't need the first voting step. You can have somebody uh, start it off and then somebody immediately improve it and you will uh, still get a reasonably good result with, uh, with fewer votes in the middle. So, um, you can optimize this by removing some of the quality control. One of its problems, and this is, uh, this is going to be the next challenge that we're going to face in crowd computing, how do we make these things run quickly? One of its problems is that this is a very slow process because it's serialized. Um, we wait for this person to work, and then we have to wait for all three of these people to vote, um, or at least two of them to vote if they both agree. Um, then we wait for this person to work, and so the serialization of all of the uh, human effort here means that one of these transcription processes typically takes an hour or two to complete to get through those eight or nine iterations. Um, <laughs> and then the third thing to think about for a crowd algorithm is what's driving it, what's moving a, what's powering this, uh, this crowd to actually get the work done. In Mechanical Turk, that's very easy to quantify. It's just how much did you pay them. Um, other crowds may need other incentives, may need other reasons to participate, and that may affect um, how you design the system and how you design the algorithm. And we'll uh, come back to that uh, later when I talk about another system that we built on top of a crowd that's not mechanical to work and they needed other kinds of incentives. So that's our first example of uh, what we call a human computation algorithm. So I'm going to involve small contributions from uh, a whole group of people. We'll see more instances of these kinds of crowd algorithms as I move through and talk about some of our other systems. Starting with um, this one, which uh, <coughs> is a very practical problem for those of us in academia where we have arbitrary um, page limits on proposals or on uh, conference papers that we have to submit. Um, and so imagine that you're half hour before a deadline, as some of the people in this room are, um, and you're over length, right? So you've got a 10-page limit, and you're over the length, and you've already played all the tricks with shrinking the margins and shrinking the font size and the references, and um, can't get any more out of it that way. And you, as the author, really ought to be spending your time not shrinking the paper, but getting the content right, making sure that it's actually going to get accepted. So if it gets accepted for what's, what the content that's in it, not for the length. It can get rejected for the length, not, not accepted for it. Um, so what we want to do is throw a crowd at this problem so that the end user, the author, can focus on uh, what they need to and the crowd can be taken care of, bringing it down to length. Uh, <coughs> and we built this thing into uh, um, a plugin in Microsoft Word, so that's what we're seeing right now, the Microsoft Word user interface. And um, this is the part of the uh, uh, text that, that we've proposed to shorten. Um, and it sends that bit of text out to a crowd and gets back a bunch of suggestions. So this is the original text here. This is uh, um, going to be the shortened version of that text over on the right. And each place where you see purple is a place where the crowd has suggested um, a way that you can shorten 
that. And we give you a slider, give the end user a slider that they can use to actually drag the length of their paper down to where they need it to be so that it's now on 10 pages. Right? And the user interface shows you, shows the end user the substitutions that were made um, in order for that to happen. So <coughs> an important piece of this, and I'll come back to this when I talk about the design space at the end uh, um, of the talk, uh, is that we've got a user interface here that is under the control of an end user, of the requester, of the person who sort of is, has the global picture of the problem that needs to be solved. Um, and that user interface is sort of usefully aggregating uh, the contributions that the crowd made in a way that the, uh, the end user can understand and, and control. So how does this work? <coughs> well, in order to... Um, in order to get good quality answers back from the crowd, good quality suggestions about what to edit um, from the crowd, um, we, put the end, we put the text through um, a process we call find, fix, verify, where um, first a small group of people looks for places in the text that are fatty and that could be shortened. All they're really doing is highlighting um, sentences or phrases that are wordy. And to get uh, uh, a quality here, we, um, we look for agreement. We look for essentially common votes between two members of the crowd about a particular wordy or fatty place. And so those, any patch that has at least two people voting for it um, passes through to the next step, which asks a different group of people to make suggestions about how to make this wordy phrase shorter. So we collect suggestions from a bunch of people um, and then, again, to deal with the fact that some of those suggestions will be bad, we pass those to a, uh, a voting step where a different group of people um, selects the ones that um, basically are the worst, the, 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 the ones that introduce errors. Yes, question. So I, I guess I can think of two things to say. Like if I'm going to find fatty text, I probably am thinking about the edits as I'm going along. I mean, that's how I would do it. I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering whether the people who found them actually already thought they had a fix. Um, <laughs> that may be true, but... Uh, um, I mean, it may not be true. It, well, yeah, you, there, are, there are actually several ways that you, can, that you can read, right? I mean, you can see that something is, uh, is wordy without wanting to, uh, without taking the extra step of how do you actually rephrase it. Um, so it does make the task easier. Although that seems pretty automated. I, mean, I was thinking like maybe long words and a lot of prepositional phrases or passives or mm -hmm. there are probably syntactic instructions. I actually think that this is an automatable task. Um, the issue is that there are no corporate for it yet that we can train on. So, and I'll, I'll come back to this also when we talk about the design space at the end. Um, that the process of you know, identifying these wordy places and making suggestions about how to improve them will produce a, uh, a corpus of examples that we can then train um, a natural language processing system to be able to find a lot of these wordy places automatically, right? And use that then, in fact, as a complement to the crowd to, uh, um, uh, to get a higher performing system. Yep. Um, good. So, let me talk a little bit about how it performs. Um, so with the parameters that, uh, that we chose, um, which are about uh, three to five people for each of those steps, um, we end up cutting a typical text by about 15%. So that would take an 11-page paper uh, roughly and make it into a 10-page paper. Um, and the cost is uh, comparable, when we run on a mechanical turg, it's comparable to what we would pay a uh, professional proofreader, about $1.50 per paragraph, um, to do a similar kind of editing. Uh, the difference is that we can parallelize this across a whole crowd of people on Mechanical Turk, each of them working independently on different paragraphs, whereas that professional proofreader is pretty much reading the paper serially from the beginning to the end. So we can get this done faster. And in fact, the median time is uh, 20 minutes for this whole process to run, uh, <coughs> which is, uh, is great compared to a single human being reading your 10-page um, your paper, um, but is, uh, is not great compared to the features that are built into Microsoft Word already. 
right? You don't want to be spending 20 minutes waiting for Microsoft Word to do something, right? There's nothing in Microsoft Word that is that slow. The built-in spelling and grammar correction does not take 20 minutes. Um, but if you actually break this down, it turns out that the time that people actually spend working on this task, reading paragraphs, making suggestions, that they're actually doing uh, the task, the critical path of that is only two minutes, which is much more in the order of, uh, um, of what might be reasonable for an interactive graphical user interface like Microsoft Word. A lot of the time is spent with the task just posted on Mechanical Turk waiting for somebody to come along and pick them up. So this basically recruiting time, this time to collect the crowd is a, is a major cost and one that, uh, um, one that we can look at eliminating. And the, um, the next project I'm going to show you in a moment does eliminate it. Before I get there, I want to show this example, which uh, <coughs> I think highlights the benefit that <coughs> this crowd gives you over the existing group of human beings that are already involved in the process. So we wrote a paper about this system, and you pretty much can't write a paper about a text processing system without putting the paper through the text processing system itself. So we fed our own paper through, uh, um, through Soylent's Find, Fix, Verify process. Um, <coughs> and in addition to having that shortening feature that uh, I've been talking about, another feature of Soylent is a simple proofreading feature that looks for grammar and spelling errors. And the crowd uh, found a grammar error that was missed by everybody else, all the other human beings that um, were working on this paper. And the paper had eight co-authors. So um, there was already a small crowd that was working on it. And it's this one right here. Um, this word, introduce, um, <coughs> which uh, uh, was also missed by um, Microsoft Word's built-in grammar checker. And the reason is this actually is a reasonable parse of the system that it simply doesn't have the right sense. So uh, shorten should produce many alternative rewrites or introduce grammatical errors is not really something that we want our system to do, but it's perfectly good parts, right? What we want our system to do is without changing the meaning of the original text or introducing grammatical errors, right? So this word in introduce should be introducing. Um, so Microsoft Word missed it because it didn't really know what the sense of this paragraph was. Um, why did these eight co-authors miss it? I think it's because this paragraph was down at the bottom of page five. And when you proofread a paper, you typically read it from page one. By the time you get to page five, you're tired. You've been looking for things, lots of things other than grammar um, that you're paying attention to. Um, the crowd, when they looked at this paragraph, they were seeing it fresh. And this was the only paragraph they were looking at. And furthermore, they were told, you have to find something wrong in this paragraph. Um, so they found it. Um, <coughs> so. That's an example of a practical system. Here's another practical system that we've built that, uh, yes, question. Oh, before you dive in, so one of the questions I have about this is, is something like global changes, like one of your examples on prototyping, so you're suggesting changing the prototype to test. Um, so when you're, when you're doing this with a crowd, you're doing these short bits, but you wouldn't necessarily want to, ch you want to change every instance of prototyping you're not going to need to test to switch those words. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd have a lot of discussion. So if, is there any way to think about more global kinds of changes that would need to happen? That is a great question, and it's still definitely an open question. I mean, because we, because in order to take advantage of the parallelism of the crowd, we really have to chop things down into small bits. Um, the crowd is not really in a good position to think about global, uh, global things like this. Um, when I when I come back, uh, I'll come back to your question later on when I talk about another system that is going to face a similar problem. It's not English reviewing, but it's code reviewing where you, you have similar questions about local things versus sort of global um, global issues. I mean, my the argument for it, for this case is that because you have an end user in the system, the end user really has to take the responsibility for these global things and. Um, we try to give them a user interface that lets them see what changes were made so that hopefully they think about that particular change and the Im implications it might have for the entire artifact, but it really, it really has to be uh, put on that end user's shoulders. Um, <coughs> so, is there any constraints on this? For example, whenever you don't use the word prototype, 
any other word can be used. That's a great idea. We don't have that kind of feature in here yet. I mean, it, would, it takes a fair, fair amount of thinking, but it, one of my brilliant colleagues in here, um, Matt Easter, had been looking at the vocab list before he starts writing. It's like, these are the key terms. These are the key terms that we have. Ah. And so it occurs to me that we could potentially have yes. that constraint, because it's, it's actually good for, it's a good writing. And one of the nice features of uh, I think crowd-powered systems compared to um, compared to purely software systems is you do have that ability for the end user to add some instructions. Um, Soylent, these features of Soylent don't have that built in, um, but uh, you know we all know how to write instructions to people, and in fact we we have some features in Soylent that. We're not perfect. I would worry that in some ways. Some ways then you're, you're relying on... I think we're better instruction writers than we are programmers as a whole. Yeah. So if we're doing that comparison, if you let me make that straw man comparison, um, uh, we're a step above that. Great. <coughs> um, here's a second practical system that, uh, that we've built, and it's actually practical in the sense that uh, tens of thousands of blind people have this installed on their phones, and they're asking dozens of questions with it every day. Um, this is... Uh, um, this is built by Jeff Bigham from University of Rochester when he uh, was visiting my lab a few years ago. Um, and he, he and his group have continued to, uh, to evolve it and deploy it and support it. Um, the system's called VizWiz, and the idea is that a blind person using their iPhone um, takes a picture of something in the world. Maybe it's a uh, can in their cabinet, maybe it's uh, you know, a couple of doors in front of them, and then they speak a question about it, and that picture and the audio of the question and also a transcription, uh, um, uh, speech to text transcription of the question um, is sent to a crowd. And that crowd types in answers that go back to the uh, blind person's phone and are read aloud, right? So it's a very simple use of a crowd. Um, and in fact, it has <laughs> virtually no quality control here, right? The quality control now is sort of put entirely into the end user's um, responsibility. Um, and it's up to them to sort of listen to all the answers that come back and decide what the sort of general sense of the crowd is uh, um, for, this, for this question. Uh, <coughs> but one of the things that VizWiz works hard to do is uh, get the speed of question answering um, as fast as possible. And so it plays a number of tricks. Some of those tricks are kind of mechanical Turk-specific tricks, like optimizing where their tasks appear on the list of tasks available to, uh, um, to workers. And some of them related to uh, sort of uh, uh, optimizing systems issues, like uh, hiring workers a little bit before you need them. So even before uh, the question is ready, you can hire workers and have them, um, have them actually answer old questions to sort of get them up to speed on what it is they're going to do. And then as soon as the uh, um, blind person is finished taking their photo and speaking their question, you just slot that new real-time question right there into the, uh, into the worker sequence and they answer it much more quickly. So, these numbers here are the time that it uh, took for the answer to come back. So simple questions like are there picnic tables here can come back very quickly. This is like 13 seconds. Hard questions, and this is a hard question because the blind person has taken a fuzzy picture of the wrong side of the can. Um, <coughs> turns out blind people don't take very good pictures. That's uh, one thing that we learned from BizWiz. Um, they, they take longer to come back. So this is 180 seconds, about, uh, um, about three minutes to come back. But um, they're still also actually very good. So uh, again, this sort of shows the, um, the great problem solving skills that we know that human beings have and that come out in, in things like this and also came out in handwriting transcription. I guess this is a great place for a little dialogue. Isn't it? I mean, sure. You actually send back and say, "Please turn the can." Oh, uh, you do see those things. So, and you see a bit of that here. The image is difficult to see, but you also see people making suggestions like, you know, you need to pull the phone away from it a little bit, or you need to uh, turn on more light, or I can't see the whole can. Can you move to the right? Um, those those kinds of feedback um, definitely do happen. Um, for the designer, can you tell them how you identify this problem? 
How do you discover yeah. context? How do you discover the context? The best person to ask that would be Jeff Bigham okay. because he's, uh, he's immersed in this space. He does a lot of work on assistive technology. So um, I, he would be the one to be able to talk to you about the genesis of the idea. Okay. Um, my sense of it is that it's, it, it comes from sort of observing that blind people already need to do these things with sighted sometimes sighted strangers, they ask these kinds of questions to someone who's right next to them. Um, so this is sort of a way, how do you virtualize that sighted stranger? How do you make them available uh, you know, in the blind person's pocket without relying on having them there in your life? Okay, can I ask a question? <laughs> you talked about how on the Amazon site you used money as an incentive, and I look at someone taking nearly 10 minutes to identify a can of beans. And I'm thinking, what incentivizes someone to do that? Um, now, you're doing it for a blind person or a visually impaired person, so maybe you're just altruistic and you want to help somebody out. But what does this website or, or, or what, what does this tool use to incentivize? And is there anything linked to the difficulty of the task um, or the quality of, of the upfront problem? OK, the, the first thing that I want to uh, just sort of fix here is that this this uh, uh, 10 minutes is the time that, it, that this answer arrived back on the blind person's phone. This doesn't actually mean that somebody was working on it for that time. It was probably actually presented to a succession of people on Mechanical Turk who gave up on it. Um, and it, it keeps trying to recruit more people to answer it until it gets an answer. So it's not necessarily 10 minutes worth of time. Um, <coughs> Um, we did prototype this on top of Mechanical Turk, but we're also building up, Jeff's lab is also building up a network of volunteers who are willing to do this um, for free, uh, you know, again, for, for altruistic reasons. Um, also, Jeff, Jeff's also interestingly um, looked at comparing um, the end user's attitude, um, and this is where you have to start thinking about the kinds of crowds that you have behind it. The end user's attitude towards asking questions on Mechanical Turk, where the audience is anonymous, um, strangers, people who don't know the blind person and vice versa, um, and paid for their work um, against asking the questions of the end user's own social network of, on Facebook. So they have a back end for this that will take this question simply post it as a Facebook status and collect the comments from it as, uh, um, as answers that come back. Um, and what they found is that for many questions, blind users are much more comfortable asking them of the stranger crowd, of the mechanical Turk crowd, than they are of asking on um, Facebook. And for a number of reasons, some of them related to privacy. Um, you, know, you don't really want to, your whole social network to know that you're asking about this rash that's on your life. Um, but uh, some of them also related to uh, you know not knowing how much. Uh, social capital I'm sort of consuming by spamming my friends with, uh, with all of these questions. And some of them also um, related to the blind person wanting to have a sense of independence that uh, um, they're sort of much more conscious of when they're using their social network than they are when they're using something that feels much more like a, a system, a computer system, like mechanical. <coughs> I hope that sort of addressed some of the questions. Um, so what this system, from a systems point of view, it's a very interesting application, um, and I'll come back uh, a little later to, to some of the ways that this is uh, an interesting, distinct application. But from a systems point of view, what it was trying to do was push this speed, you know, which I showed you in the previous uh, uh, system was on the order of 20 minutes to get uh, results back from uh, Find, Fix, Verify. We're getting things back in, you know, tens of seconds. Can we push that down even even lower. Can we get uh, um, a crowd-powered system, something that's human beings behind it in the back end, and that feels much more like an interactive application like we're used to running on our, um, on our smartphones. And so here's some of our um, most recent work done by um, Michael Bernstein, who was a PhD student in my lab um, last year. Um, um, that is a crowd-powered camera. And the idea is to find just the right moment when I should have clicked the shutter in order to capture a frame. And to use a crowd of people to do that rather than using an automatic algorithm which uh, um, is not sort of aware of aesthetics. So here, the way we do it is we leave 
essentially leave the shutter open for 10 seconds, collect the 10 second video, stream that video up to a small crowd on Mechanical Turk, and uh, in the sort of time that it would take the, just the end user to review that 10 second video, on the order of 10 seconds, in other words, um, the crowd has picked out a still frame from that video that they think is the best one, is the, the most interesting, the most uh, salient, or the moment when you should have snapped that action shot, for example. <coughs> and that, so that happens in, in less than 10 seconds. Um, and there's two steps to that. The first one is making sure that we have a crowd already available so that we don't have to wait for people to pick up the Mechanical Turk task. Um, so we did some experiments with uh, very short, essentially, retainers, um, putting a crowd on retainer for a few minutes and paying them essentially to hang around, um, do other things if they want, just as long as they're there and ready to watch a video as soon as we have a video ready for them. Um, and it, it, at least the Mechanical Turk, it costs a very little additional bonus in order to uh, persuade somebody to just stick around. Because they can do other things at the same time. They can do other Mechanical Turk tasks, they can watch, read Facebook, whatever. Um, what we're doing is asking them to just stick. Uh, <coughs> but um, they don't always stick around. Uh, and um, what we found is that uh, if, if we want to get a crowd of people back within um, within two seconds, so we want them to start doing something within two seconds, uh, and they've been waiting around for five minutes, then only about half of them are going to come back within, uh, within two seconds. But that means we recruit twice as many people as we actually need, six people instead of three. Um, we're going to get, we're going to be able to get those three people working within, within two seconds. So that's only half of the battle. So having the crowd already there and ready to, uh, ready to do something is, uh, um, is good. But, uh, in order to actually get an answer back, you have to, um, coordinate that crowd so that they work together quickly. Um, and in this, uh, in this, uh, video space, this, this frame selection space, <coughs> what we've come up with um, is a way to, um, to get them to agree on a good frame um, in less than 10 seconds by first randomly positioning their sliders within this video. So the video is not actually playing, it's paused, but they can scrub around using sliders. Um, so we randomly position their, uh, their sliders and observe how their sliders are moving around as they examine the video. And when some fraction, typically we use a third of the crowd, dwells in the same neighborhood of the video for some um, particular duration of time, we use two seconds in our experiments, um, we use that as a signal that, that something in that neighborhood is interesting. And we actually compress the video. We, we crop the video down to that neighborhood and bring all of the crowd now into that neighborhood. So we're now all of the crowd is just examining this smaller segment of the video. And then we do that recursively um, until we get down to a single frame. So it's a way to combine low latency and quality control into the same process and get a good result um, uh, out in a very short amount of time. So here's a comparison of that algorithm that I just described. Um, and what we're seeing here are, uh, this is a histogram of the running time to find a, uh, a final best frame. And the rapid refinement algorithm, this is about 12 second mark here, um, runs uh, predictably quickly and with a narrow, um, with sort of a narrow spread. Compare that against VizWiz's approach so with VizWiz, you know, a trusting blind person, after they, answer, after they ask the question, they might just take the first answer that comes back. Um, but even the first answer that comes back has a longer spread than, uh, than rapid refinement does. Um, and if we use a traditional crowdsourcing quality control measure, like the handwriting recognition process at the very beginning, where we collect a bunch of answers and then vote among them, um, we're basically waiting for the slowest people in our crowd 
to make the decision. And that takes considerably <coughs> 45 seconds to do with a 10 second um, video. So we're getting faster results. Um, <coughs> here are some examples of the kinds of results that we see. Um, comparing the rapid refinement algorithm um, that I talked about with uh, a computer vision approach, which is actually the one implemented by YouTube, um, and with a single expert photographer basically taking their time and trying to pick out <coughs> the best uh, frame from this, from this still. Um, <coughs> so in the really good cases, um, rapid refinement agrees pretty closely with an expert photographer. Um, in the sort of worst cases, uh, rapid refinement can do pretty badly. And this is actually an example of the kind of trade-off that our algorithm makes. What happened to produce this blurry frame is that um, there were actually sort of two salient peaks of interest in, uh, um, in the video. And we had different parts of the crowd exploring each of these peaks. And unfortunately, we grabbed a neighborhood that was between the peaks and didn't include either one. Um, so this ended up being sort of a valley um, between the peaks. So an enhancement to this algorithm would try to recognize that there may be sort of more than one mode of, uh, of saliency, of interest in, uh, in a typical video and try to detect those modes. Rob, on the note, do you have any gut checks? Do you ever have a crowd do a gut check? That is Awesome. <laughs> yeah, do you think we came up with a good one or not? You know, yes. just click yes or no right. and maybe we'll run it again if we didn't. That's, what That's a great idea. Um, yeah, we had an experiment with that. <coughs> okay. Um, what am I doing for time? Um, the last uh, system that I want to talk about, so the previous three things that I've talked about have been built on top of mechanical turf at least prototype on top of it. Um, I want to give an example of a, uh, a very different kind of, uh, of crowd sourcing, crowd powered system that is not built on mechanical turf, but uses a, um, a different kind of crowd. Just mostly so you, you don't walk out of here thinking about this is all about the turf. Um, so we have a problem in our programming classes, um, which is that we make our students write a lot of code and we as a grading staff don't actually have time to read it all. Um, and give them good quality feedback, and particularly timely feedback uh, about what they've done. So they may hand in a problem set. Graders don't have time to read that before they've handed in another problem set um, and maybe made some of the same mistakes. And we do automatic grading. So we run their code through automatic uh, testing scripts, but it's really not sufficient. Um, it finds correctness problems, but it doesn't really um, you know, deal with uh, or, or detect awful code. So we want human readers, but, and we want as much as possible line-by-line -line feedback. Um, and it's also, in fact, good for students to practice reading code. So the natural solution we um, came up with here is uh, uh, to use a crowd of reviewers that includes students from the class, as well as uh, the traditional grading staff that we already have, and as well as alumni of the class, both people who have uh, taken a class and moved up, uh, become upperclassmen, but also people who have graduated and, uh, um, and gone out into industry. Um, and we, <coughs> we chop up these programs into uh, small bits, uh, into functions or classes, and distribute those to a crowd of reviewers. <coughs> so it's, it is crowdsourcing in that sense, in the sense that um, that we are having each person make a small contribution to the overall grading problem for, um, for the overall feedback problem. I should be careful about that. These people are not actually doing grading. They're, uh, they're writing comments to each other and those comments are, um, are hopefully helping the students learn and improve. <coughs> um, and unlike some of the systems that um, that I've been showing you so far in which the individual crowd members have sort of not been aware of each other. Even in that uh, video frame selection system, um, you couldn't see each other's, they couldn't see each other's sliders. They were just playing with their own slider, right? So there was no awareness that there were other people in the system. In, um, in this system, um, there is uh, a social reviewing process. In fact, there's multiple um, people assigned to each chunk of code 
Um, and they have a conversation, a threaded conversation about that code where they can write comments, they can reply to people's comments, they can upvote and downvote uh, things that they agree with or disagree with. Um, and where people are um, identified by name. Uh, and this, uh, you know, this is an example of the kind of change that you need to make to a reviewing system, or not a reviewing system, into a crowd-powered system um, in order to serve different kinds of incentives. So the social incentives or the reputational incentives um, that, uh, that, that are the alternative to paying people. You know, we're not paying any of these people to do their reviewing, um, so we have to reward them in different ways like um, uh, allowing other people to see the names attached to their comments. Uh, and <laughs> even though we give them a tiny chunk here, so this gets a little bit at, at, at Darren's question, um, we do give them the way, a way to get that global view if they need it and make a comment about that global view. Um, so they can look at the entire program that was submitted. Uh, <laughs> that may considerably increase the effort that they're putting into this one particular student. So in fact, uh, an active uh, um, thing they're working on right now to, uh, to uh, improve those kind of global uh, uh, comments is give the, um, the reviewers the ability to do more high-powered searches over the code that they're reviewing and, uh, um, and find other places where they can make this same comment. Um, that yeah, are I was thinking about like summary context. So just the names of the functions or the names of the classes uh, might be sort of indicative of the nature of the application that this thing is a piece of, you know, or something like that. Yeah, so the, the, the names of the functions that they're calling, for example, and... Uh, no, just, just instead of showing them the whole program, just give them the names of the functions. Oh, yeah, have. give them the skeleton of, uh, of the other classes and the other... Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, that's a great idea. There are various ways that we can think about aligning, um, aligning the code to make that, uh, make it easier to understand. Um, but from another point of view, what we're... we're what we're looking at in this particular system is uh, we want low-level comments about coding and not necessarily high-level comments about design. Um, I think a persistent challenge in crowdsourcing is how do you get that kind of global picture? How can you uh, um, use small contributions from crowds? You know, at some point, you hit a limit where uh, if you're reviewing something, for example, um, if you're uh, proofreading text, you know, there's only so much text you're going to be able to read in the five or ten minutes that you can reasonably expect a crowd person to contribute. And uh, uh, one of the questions: Do you ever find people like cycling? Like, there's a difference of opinion, so it's like it's like the Wikipedia thing where this goes back and forth. This guy keeps saying this, and so like I keep saying, you know, you, you know, in terms of these code comments. Yeah, we haven't seen cycling like that in this case. Um, I mean, I think because the reviewers aren't really responsible for coming up with a single answer. Right? In Wikipedia, there is a, like a final current version of the page, and that's what tends to get cycled over. Here, uh, once your opinion is, is out there, um, there isn't really a lot of reason to argue. Um, we have had you know, students who've been, uh, student authors who've been very resistant to some uh, reviewers, and occasionally there's been arguments between the code author and the uh, um, and the reviewer. That does happen because there the, the student does have a stake in what the final thing is going to be, and they uh, they often want to defend it. Right. We don't see a lot of those arguments between reviewers. Um, <coughs> I'll say a little bit about the experience that we've seen in this. Um, we've been using it for about a year now. Um, We've gotten uh, uh, roughly 2,000 problem sets uh, reviewed this way and 20,000 total comments, um, which comes out to about 10 um, comments that students get per submission. Um, the advantage is that they, uh, <coughs> they get those comments very, very quickly. Basically, they hand it in, they, they typically hand in their, their assignments on Thursday nights and they're getting these comments back by, uh, by Monday morning. So the, the code reviewing process happens over a weekend. And again, that's because we're um, farming it out to a large crowd that is processing these, uh, um, processing these reviews independently, uh, in parallel. Um, I'll just skip over some of this. Um. <coughs> okay, so. I've given you a lightning tour of some of the things that we built. Uh, I want to finish by talking about the uh, design space 
that, uh, that we think crowds are now enabling us. So, um, and that, as I was saying, that, that's, that, that space is having three dimensions. You know, one is, is this end user, the one who wants the work done. So this is like the author of the paper or the, um, uh, the blind person asking the question. Uh, another point in this space is purely software solutions to help them get that done. Artificial intelligence, let's say. So a, uh, a purely computer vision um, algorithm that tries to answer the question, the blind person's question, would, uh, would go along that dimension. And then there's this crowd space, drawing on people from out in the crowd making small contributions. <coughs> One thing that's interesting about crowd computing is now it sort of enables us to think about traditional prototyping techniques like Wizard of Oz, you know, the idea of in the lab using a human being to simulate what we don't know how to do with artificial intelligence yet or what we're thinking about building if we could. Um, we can take that technique which used to be used, usable only in the lab and think about actually deploying it. So VizWiz is a deployed Wizard of Oz system, right? One that uh, is actually being used by blind people in context in their daily lives on tasks that they actually need. Um, so, and what we're collecting from that is a corpus of questions, of uh, images and spoken questions that actually correspond to those blind people's needs. So we can take that data and then train up AI that is really specific to that task. And we can also see that uh, being a potential benefit of, uh, um, of the Soylent system, the, uh, the, the word processing system, and, uh, and of the, uh, the crowd-powered camera system as well. So we can think using a crowd, about using a crowd uh, as a way to push a prototype out there in the world and see whether it actually works. <coughs> um, I think in this space, and I, I, I mentioned this before in the context of, of sort of global decisions and global overview, that uh, um, the end user still plays an important role and we really need to think about giving that user an interface, the user interface that lets them have control over the process and understanding what's going on in the process. And, um, I think of the slider in, uh, um, in our Microsoft Word plugin as being a great example of this, that you want to give them a good user interface that's appropriate to the um, tasks that they want. And they also have final responsibility and, and really they're there to provide the, the global picture, the global coherence. This isn't all about Mechanical Turk. It's a great crowd for prototyping things on, but uh, it may not be uh, the eventual crowd that you want to deploy it on, and other deployment crowds may involve other kinds of design considerations that affect the end user. So I mentioned blind people's reluctance to uh, post things on their Facebook page, um, and you know our use of, uh, of crowds at MIT that required us to change the way we design the system in order to support these um, different kinds of incentives other than money. We've learned to think a little bit about how to do crowd system design. So some of these algorithms that I talked about, like find, click, and verify and the iterative uh, improve and vote <coughs> algorithm. Dividing the work into small chunks gives you faster, um, faster processing. And you have to expect noise and design for noise. And I love Mechanical Turk for that reason, because you really do get noise right away. Um, but interesting thing in this space also is these crowds are basically humans. So you have to think about when you're thinking about an application that's going to be built on top of a crowd, what is it that this crowd, that these people out there are actually providing that the end user can't already do themselves? What are the differential abilities or competence for um, just diversity that, uh, that the crowd is providing? So we have an example of that in the Soylent system where um, the crowd, because of their the different way they were approaching this problem, was able to do something with the authors of this is, of course, the crowd has eyes and the, uh, the end user is not. So here's some new, uh, um, some ongoing work that, that we're doing and uh, it sort of, uh, some of it sort of launches off of these existing, uh, uh, these existing projects. So um, thinking about VizWiz, which has a blind person as the end user and sighted people out on the web as the crowd, um, we're evolving that to help um, other kinds of people with situational disabilities, like a person behind the wheel of a car um, is very situationally disabled, 
basically blind and motor impaired and attention impaired with respect to everything that might happen on their phone, right? Um, so uh, we're designing systems that will allow people from uh, hired from a crowd to be able to help a driver with their information. Um, from, uh, um, from the sort of Soylent point of view, from the uh, word processing point of view, we're all going to have to think about programming and how a, uh, sort of any, uh, a, 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 a single programmer can draw on small contributions from other programmers um, for a short time, uh, hired from um, a more expert crowd. So we, we're not using Mechanical Turk for this work. We're using uh, crowd platforms that have programmers, people with higher skills. And there's still a bunch of open questions, and we've touched on a few of them already, like the, uh, the sort of the, the, the work size limit that inhibits the crowd members' ability to perceive global things. Um, <coughs> designing uh, systems that provide the right incentives for different kinds of crowds. Um, how you can take advantage of and use crowds that are not sitting at a desktop or a laptop, but are instead out in the world. Uh, and moving around with their mobile devices, crowds that are more experts. I'll give an example of that, people with skills in programming. Um, how you can do smarter routing of tasks. Right now, Mechanical Turk, for example, just has a big pile of stuff that people can do. And it's sort of up to the crowd to sort through it and find something that they want to do. A very stupid way to work, but that's the sort of state of the art in uh, um, crowdsourcing systems right now. And how do we actually do you know, the promise of deployable Wizard of Oz is that we'll be able to transition from a crowd-powered system to a more AI-powered system, or at least a hybrid. Um, how do we actually do that? How does that work? Can we do it automatically? Uh, so, uh, I think I've gone a bit over time, and I apologize for that, but uh, I hope I've given you a sense for um, what the possibilities are in this space.